right, this message uh, is part of a series. Um, I think this is, this is the 12th, 12th in, in, in the series. <laughs> I don't know how many more we've got. We've got we're just going to keep going. Uh, the series is called Literally, and it's called Literally because everything that the Bible says is literally the Word of God. And you can believe it all. So we're looking at, the, we're looking at history, his story. We're looking at the, the people of the Bible. We're looking at those heroes, men and women of God and those, those situations, those things that happened around them uh, and learning from that. So uh, today, the, um, well, setting up the timeline, uh, we've got Adam and Eve, real people. And, uh, and then their uh, children, you've got, obviously you've got the fall, um, and then you have, it, it, it takes those generations to uh, the, the patriarchs, which is Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, Jacob's children, uh, you have one of those Joseph, through Joseph, um, everybody's transported to Egypt. Um, they are in slavery for 400 years, and then you have Moses in the Exodus And then lots of stuff that's happening there. You have, after the exodus, they come to the promised land after 40 years. You have uh, Joshua, who takes everybody in. They conquer the land. Judges, kings, and then, because the Israelites didn't do what God had asked them to do, which was walk in his way, then God said, well, the land's going to spit you out. In the same way that that, the... the land spit out the previous inhabitants and Israel took over their land, their promised land of Israel. Um, just put an emphasis out there, their God-promised land, Israel. The promise stood with Israel and said, if you don't do, you know, if you don't walk out this way, then the land will spit you out. And that, God, God fulfills his promises in the good and the bad. He fulfills his promises, what may be kind and not, for us, maybe not so kind, but he disciplines those he loves. And... Unfortunately, Assyria and Babylon come in and they, they take all of the Israelites, those that survive, they take them into captivity. Now, this is where we find ourselves right now, a period of captivity. It was around 70 years that they were in Babylon. And during this time, um, we find the book of Daniel. And Daniel is this, uh, he's this guy who's been taken from Israel as a, as a young man. He was part of one of the captives. Um, and he's got some buddies with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, uh, and these, these four guys, I'm not sure if I'm saying it, uh, am I saying it right? Yeah. Abednego? Yeah, 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 okay. A bit of a murmur there, and I'm mm. thinking there may be my pronunciation. Yeah. Um, we've got these, these, these four men who, um, for one reason or another, God places them in positions of authority. Uh, the Bible talks about Daniel and says there's something inside him. The, the spirit of the living God is, is actually what's inside him. And, and, and he just stood out. These, these, these guys, they stood out. Um, Daniel chapter 2, verse 49. Um, first of all, we've got Daniel who stands out and he is established. And that's another, I'm not going to go into Daniel today. I'm focusing on Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to, uh, today. Um, It says here in Daniel 2.49, Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So this this is the scene. Israel has been completely wiped from their land, and and the survivors have been taken into captivity. And um, and amongst those captives, there were some, some people who... God placed them in places of authority. As dark times as they're living, there's something in them and they're placed in a position of authority, a place of of rulership, of of leading. Um, The message today is called the bold and the beautiful. The bold and the beautiful. Because something I see in Daniel and in these three guys is just an, an incredible boldness. Now, Chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 6. I'm just going to read through it all because it's better explained uh, here. It says here, Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
Right. What's happened is that, is that King Nabu, he, he's, he's this quite, you know, he's almost, I would say he's kind of like a Trump figure. <laughs> I would say that he's this guy who just, he believes in himself and he is not lacking self-confidence. And he loves himself. And, and actually, he has, he has gone out and conquered the, the known world. He's gone out and no one has stood before him. Even Israel, that was, was a, a ruling power, they've, they've fallen at his hands. And, and actually, God used Nebuchadnezzar to, to, to take them into captivity. So this guy is like sitting pretty and he's like, nobody's going to challenge my power. And he sets up this image. And he says, I'm, I, you know, what, what else shall I do with my money? Well, I'm going to make this image of gold. He makes this massive image of gold. And he says, whenever the, the music sounds, everyone's going to bow down. They're going to worship this, this image that I've created. And it says that all the nations and peoples of every language, they all fell down and they worshipped They worshipped this image. I carry on. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp. Just want to make sure. It doesn't mention the tambourine, eh? It doesn't mention the tambourine. We hate tambourines in this book. All kind of music, well maybe it's there, must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. Furious with rage... Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And he said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Pretty scary, huh? Pretty, pretty, pretty scary. You got no, you got an opportunity here, you know. If, if we're going to play the, the lovely music, and it's going to be the, the sound of your doom if you don't worship. But this this is your chance. Bow the knee, worship this image, and then it's all good. Shadrach, Mishan, Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We don't even have to defend ourselves in this one. They maintained very high respect of the king. I just want to make it quite clear. They didn't, they didn't go, you're off your rocker. You're a complete nut job. What are you what are you doing? They just said, Your Majesty, you know what? If we die, we die. Our God can deliver us, but if we die, we die. But whatever, we are not going to worship this image. The king was furious with Shabdrak, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than, than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, the furnace so hot, that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took them up. And all these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth, hear this, hear this, this this is really, really quite powerful. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, I wonder who that fourth person was, who looks like the son of the gods. I know a son of God. 
So I wonder if this is Christ in the Old Testament. We have tons of, remember, the, all the Old Testament is just a massive big sign saying Jesus is coming. We look at every story and we try, in the Old Testament, we, we can look at the Old Testament through the light of the New Testament. What is on, what is this going on about? And I think, that's just my opinion, it could be an angel, but I think that it's Jesus. I think that Jesus is right there with them. That's, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, there's someone who's like the son of a God right there. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Guys, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come out. Come here. No, we're going to stay right here. Here we are safe. Here we're, you know, hey, we're, this is it's warm, but, but we're good. Come out. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, royal advisors crowded around them. Well, yeah, who wouldn't? They saw that the fire had not harmed them, not a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was not even that horrible barbecue smell. That awful when somebody has a barbecue and, and, or they, they have a bonfire and you're, you smell for like days. They didn't have any of that. <laughs> no smell. Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. There you go, so it could be an angel. They trusted in him and defied the king's command. They were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. They defied the king's command. They were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. So the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This, to me, is the bold and the beautiful. This is significant boldness. This is impressive, powerful boldness that, that means that actually the, the word of God or, or the person of God, the name of God is praised by this, this, this pagan king, this evil king. Because there's, there's no getting around how evil Nebuchadnezzar was. I mean, he is messed up. There's, there's, he's messed up. He does have a, an epiphany. He does have a revelation of who God is, and that's a bit later on. But, I mean, seeing all of this stuff, you would have thought, yeah, well. But this messed up king, he says, you know what? There's no other God. This, this, this is the God. And I will cut into pieces anybody who says any different. <laughs> no, we, we don't need to go that far. But... God's name is glorified through the boldness of these, these three men. So I've got three points, three magical points here. Everyone, thank you, Ollie, that it's not a seven-point sermon. The first, the first point is this. These men, they find themselves in an adverse world. They find themselves in an adverse world. They find themselves in a world which is against them. There's very much against them. The system of this world is very much against the plans of God. The system of this world is very much against, against the people of God. It's against Jesus. It's against what God wants to do. And, that, and, and I can see this here in the scripture because it says as soon as, as you hear the sound, all the peoples and all the nations fall down and worship. How many? It says all of them. <laughs> it says all of them. All of them bow down and worship. Those that are standing, they, they, they look around left, right and centre. And everybody is like, dude, get down. Dude, get down. What are you doing? Everybody. My mum used to say, you know, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you do it? I'd be like, if you carry on, Maybe. <laughs> But everybody's doing it. The, kid, the kids, are, kids don't follow that, all right? <laughs> but Ollie said, <laughs> if everybody's doing it, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right. History is littered with examples of society getting it absolutely wrong. And yet everybody just, just jumped on the bandwagon. 
just because it's commonplace, just because society values it, does not mean it's what we should be doing. But you say, well, they're doing it, well, they're doing it. It's, I think maybe we have this response of teenagers where we go, yeah, but my friend gets to stay up all night. Or my friend gets to use their phone, you know, 48 hours in a day. Just go, yeah, but not in this house. <laughs> we're we're going to do it, do it slightly different. The system of this world is very much against the things of God. And, and I think we need to recognise that because it, it's not always going to, it's not going to go our way. Galatians 1.10 This is Paul writing and he says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? If I'm trying to please people, if I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So you really, you you see what everyone's doing and I, I just want to make it quite clear. We are in adverse times. The UK is post christian there have been revivals and we, we, we pray for more revival. We, we pray for, for the Holy Spirit to move and there'd be a massive revival. We pray for that. There have been revivals and there were times when the whole country just sought God. But, but we're kind of, it's almost like, well, we don't need God anymore. We're already good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Thank you. Yeah, I know all about God. That's fine. Don't need it. I'll go for weddings, funerals, you name it, but I'm not going to do more than that. Post-Christian. And people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, I believe in God. But there's a huge percentage of people who go, no, no, that's a load of boulder dash. load of rubbish. <laughs> Let's be clear on this. You either please God or you please the world. You please God, you please the people. We are the, mon- the minority. We are the rebellion, people. <laughs> there is a reason why Jesus said the road for destruction is wide. And those that find the, the narrow path are few. Matthew seven thirteen. Small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life and only a few find it. The system of this world is against God. It's actively working to attack God's plan, God's people. All the things that God loves, that's what the enemy wants to dis- discredit. He is there, he is real, the enemy is there. He has an army at his beck and call. And he has the system of the world that backs it up. Jesus said that, The prince of this world has come. He has nothing on me. The prince of the the prince of this world. Two Corinthians four four. Satan, who is the god of this world. Oh, hold up. Does that mean that there are other gods? Well, yeah. The world has plenty of gods. There's only one god. There's only one, and he does not share power. There is only one god, and he does not share glory. There is only one god. So everything else is a false god. Everything else would set itself up to be God. But it is not God. There is only one. Satan, who is the God, let's put God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. He is God himself. Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. This world is hostile to God. And I don't know if you recognise, if, if you read the news, if you see the, 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 the news on the telly, if you look at Google News, it is anti-Christ. Our God is used as a swear word. That's how bad it is. It's the only God who's used as a swear word. And that is because this system is set against God. It is hostile to God. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. Now we are in the world, we're not of the world. Our citizenship is of heaven. But we're in it. Now... That doesn't mean that there's not plenty of amazing things in this world and we can enjoy those things. I mean, I'm not going to set up a monastery and separate myself and just dedicate myself to, you know, not interacting. Because that's the, Jesus came into the world and he, and he reached out his hands to the world and he loved the world. 
For God so loved the world. So, so it's not that we don't love the world. It's just that the love of the world is not, is not in us and overcomes us. And, and so then we reject God. I want to make it quite clear. We do not separate ourselves. We are the salt of the earth. God has, has, has called us to do that. So we're in the world. We're supposed to live in this world. But it's not going to be easy. I was reading uh, this morning Revelation 12. A couple of people have asked for end time teachings. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Why? <laughs> going to have to go back and study a whole ton. People want to know about the end times. I'd rather just put that off. Revelation 12. Then the dragon, talking about Satan, he was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. And I'm not going to go into what all of that means, but those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus, the warfare is set against us. We, we, are, in, we are in a war. And, and that is a reality. So in this world, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. That's my first point. We are in adverse times. Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego found themselves in adverse times. The, the very king of that place challenged them personally. My point, my second point is the challenge is to do what is right by God. What is right by God. Because we're going to experience difficult times internally and externally. Inside your life, personal battles. There's going to be stuff going on in your heart. There's going to be stuff going on in your mind. There's going to be stuff going on with your securities and insecurities. There's going to be a battle with sin that we're, we, we all have. There's also going to be external battles. What's happening with government? What's happening with society? What's happening with Israel? What's happening with your, your view, your What's happening? There's, there's lots of stuff that's happening outside. What's happening in your workplace? What's happening in your university or your college? What's happening in your school? What's the influence that's coming against you? There's going to be internal, external battles. The challenge is, well, God, what do you want? Because we are going to face persecution. Jesus promised it. So the challenge is to live for Jesus. The Bible is full of adversity. Every single one of those men and women, those heroes, they faced adversity. So if you're thinking that the Christian life should be, you know, colour of roses and just sweet smelling and wonderful and just kumbaya, it's not going to be like that. You stand for Jesus, you stand for God, you will be a target for the whole system of the world. You become a target. There is a target on your back. Because you've made yourself aware to, unfortunately, the spiritual world. That you're covered by the blood. And Satan doesn't like that. Jesus offends. His name offends. So God's people have a target on their back. The Jewish people have a target on their back. Because they're God's chosen people. Whether they know Jesus or not, whether they come into the knowledge of the Messiah and they, they find salvation in Jesus, the gifts of God are irrevocable. So, so Israel are a chosen people and we stand for the, for the people of Israel. We bless the people. We pray for the peace of Israel. I'm not going to get into the politics of it. I'm just going to say we stand for the people of Israel. We bless them because that's what God tells us to do. But they, I kid you not, they have a target on their back. Whatever they do, there is a t the enemy is going in for them. Christians are the joke, the stupid, the weak, the laughable of this world. And, and Paul actually mentions, he says, if, if what we believe is nonsense, then we are the most pitiful. We are the miserable of this world. Because we are the butt of everybody's joke. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty, who neither serve your gods nor worship this image of gold you've set up. You see, they're just bobbling along, trying to get along with their life and do whatever is in front of them. And the enemy singles them out. The enemy points them out and gets everybody to point fingers and go, look at them. When someone comes up to you and goes, but you're a Christian, right? Shouldn't you be 
But oh, hold up, don't single me out. We don't want to be singled out. But people are observing, people are looking, and they're looking for opportunities to, to discredit you. Now, my response to that is, well, I'm, I'm as flawed as anyone else. <laughs> but I'm, Jesus loves me, and in spite of me, he loves me. But the world doesn't get that. They think, well, you know, if you're a Christian, then you're an idiot. You're, you're a fool. Why, why do you believe six days of creation? What kind of a nut, nut are you? They wanted to live a relaxed life, and they get pulled in. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. <laughs> And they face the challenge, who or what are we living for? And they're just not willing to worship the system or the king of this age. They're just not, they're just not willing to do it. Because they know you shall have no gods before me. You will make no image of anything before me. You'll not bow down or worship God's top ten. God's top ten. Don't have any image before me. Don't make any image of me. Don't bow down or worship. And they just go, no, we're just not going to do that. Sorry, sorry, Nabin, we're just not going to do that. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. So we are in adverse times. And the challenge is what does God want? My third point is this, God works through us, giving boldness. Giving boldness. Boldness to live out that challenge. It's a fine line, everybody. We, we get it wrong again and again and again. But we pick ourselves up and we go, Lord, you know, through you I can do all things. Through you, all, you're the God who strengthens me. Courage and boldness is not without fear. Because sometimes people say, fear not. And I go, I'm full of fear. Yeah. <laughs> what? Fear not? Have you seen what, what's happening to everybody who doesn't worship? They get thrown into a fiery furnace. They become a human barbecue. I'm not keen on that idea. Thankfully, no sharks were involved. So, you know, I'd be like, all right, I can do that. Fear is there. You're, you're facing a battle with cancer. Fear will very much be part of it. And for somebody to come along and say, have faith. Remove all fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear. I, I accept that. I understand that here in my head. But to bring that into my heart where my fear comes up and jumps up, that I just cannot do. And the fear remains. Courage, boldness is not without fear. It's that your, your trust, your, your strength comes from Jesus and that overcomes the fear. That you, you can actually go, God, you know, I don't even want to say press it down because that would just leave it there. I, want to, I think hand it up. Give it over to God. Give it to you. I, I don't want to live with this fear. I don't want to be overcome by this fear. I don't want to conform to this fear. I want to stand in faith. I want to stand in boldness. Lord, give me boldness. The word boldness in the Greek is parhesia, which means the freedom of speech, candor, cheerful courage, fearless speech, even at the cost of life. Free speech. We have a God who believes in free speech. We don't have a God that if you question or you, you even get upset with him or have a go at him, he's going to strike you with a thunderbolt. We have a God who understands, who loves, who's willing to have those discussions, actually encourages those discussions. And he's a God who understands fear. I think if, if anything, Jesus in Gethsemane, where, where he was sweating blood... That came because of great fear of what he was, he was facing. It wasn't, it wasn't being, being nailed to a cross that was causing that fear. It was the, the separation of the Father. It was the, the, the sin of the world that was starting to infiltrate and just come upon his shoulders. That great level of fear our Messiah has experienced. But he said, not my will be done, but your will. And he was able to overcome that fear. 
It's a boldness to say, God, what you want. Not our opinion, but what you want. This is the Holy Spirit boldness that is talked about in Acts 4.29. Where the, the disciples, the apostles, they had, they had experienced some persecution. They'd been beaten up because they were preaching the name of Jesus. And they say this, now Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through your name. Of your holy servant Jesus. And they prayed and the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit fills, the Holy Spirit strengthens. And the boldness is is part of it. It's, it, it's, like, it's like speaking in tongues. When you buy a shoe, you don't buy a shoe for the tongue. But it comes with it. It's, it's part of the shoe. Yeah? My feet don't smell, Becky. It's all... <laughs> when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and tongues come, you, you don't do it for, for the tongues, but it comes with it. And boldness comes with it. Part of the package of the Holy Spirit being filled. That's why we, we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we, we seek to be strengthened. Like David said, that, that all that calamity was upon him and he strengthened himself in the Lord. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They had, they had just this, this knowledge, this absolute conviction that... If God wants to save us, he'll save us. If he doesn't want to save us, it's all right. But we're not going to do that. So it's a Holy Spirit boldness to to say what he wants to say. And you don't even have to worry about what am I going to say or what am I going to do. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible says very clearly, that don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will give you the words and will give you what to do. I'll finish with this. Revelation 12, 11. They triumphed over the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They overcame through the blood of the Lamb and through the testimony that they just, they said, our life is yours, God. Do with it what you want. They had that, they had such boldness that they said, okay, if my life be forfeit, it is forfeit. I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for the King. And, and what that is talking about, and when we go into the end times, uh, and we, we have a look at all of that, I'll explain all of that. But, but basically, when persecution, when battles come, when you recognise that you're in a battle, when you recognise the, adverse, the adversity is there, you just say, God, whatever happens, you are God. You're on your throne. You are sovereign. And I belong to you. And Lord, please give me boldness. Give me boldness. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Give me boldness. Let's pray. Jesus, whatever whatever we face, you absolutely understand it. You absolutely understand it. You're aware of it. You, You know And Lord, where where else do we go? Who else has words of life? Who else has overcome death? Lord, we look to you as as our strength. We look to you as the, the, the source of boldness. Boldness to live as you would want us to live. And Holy Spirit, you're the one that 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 shows that to everybody. You're the one that puts that toward everybody. You're the the best teacher. You're the one that guides. You're the one that leads. You're the one that shows each one of us what we should be doing, how we should be living, because you glorify the Son. So Holy Spirit, we look to you and we ask, fill us anew. Give us this boldness to face whatever comes our way. Whatever fear would come, whatever battle would come, that we will find strength in you. 
In Jesus' name. That's, that's what I declare over every one of us this morning. I declare boldness in the Holy Spirit. Boldness in Jesus' name. Boldness for knowing who he is. Knowing what he's done. Knowing what he's going to do. Boldness.